thank you for being here, um, especially the people that joined us uh, recently and whatever number of people are in online. Okay, let me introduce the speaker uh, today, this, more, this um, afternoon, Richard Villa de Sue. Professor Emeritus, he said, he's a professor emeritus in the Department of Theology at Fordham University. Uh, he's a Roman Catholic priest with 50 years of pastoral experience serving in both the Latin and Ruthenian Byzantine rites. He has written extensively on philosophical theology, ascetics, and homiletics. He is a practicing artist and an amateur musician, as well as a writer. So um, let's welcome Richard to the podium. Richard. Thank you very much, Julio, and to all of you. This has been a very interesting time for me, demonstrating the truth of the, uh, the Jaina epistemology of an ekanta vada, uh, no single point of view, uh, which I think is a, a wonderful thing. Uh, several years ago, I was living in a parish that hired a new organist, young man, Jed, who came from somewhere in the mountains in the south. And the pastor invited him to dinner to get to know him a bit more. And he asked him at one point, well, Jed, uh, what church do you belong to? And he said, well, I figure I belong to any church that I play the organ in. So the pastor, oh, fair enough, but what, what about your, your background, your family? He said, wow, we're Baptists. The pastor said, well, Baptists, there's a lot of different kind of Baptists in America. What, what sort of Baptists were you? Jed says, well, we're snake handlers. Well, we were all aghast. But uh, as you probably know, there are, particularly in the Appalachian Mountains, there are churches of people who take literally the passage in Mark's gospel where Jesus says that his disciples were able to tread on scorpions and handle snakes and be unharmed. So the pastor says to Jed, uh, well, did you ever, ever see anybody get bitten? And Jed says, oh yeah, my uncle, he was bit bad by a rattler. The pastor says, right. but he was okay. It says, nope, he died. <laughs> well, I introduced this not in order to start a conversation about the pros and cons of handling vipers, but uh, to ask you architects, suppose you've got a commission to design a church for a congregation of snake handlers. Obviously, you'd have to have a large sanctuary area, because that's where you keep the boxes of the snakes, and that's where people dance around with the snakes. Where they, when that testimony comes, there has to be a pulpit, there has to be a large space for the musicians. Uh, there will be pews in the church, because a lot of the service consists in listening to the word of God, uh, but there also has to be enough space for people to get up and testify, and sometimes to dance in the aisles, uh, principally. Now suppose at the same time, you're a very successful architect, at the same time, you get a commission to design a Byzantine church, which has to have a cupola and a curved apse and a full iconostasis with curtains that can be closed and three doors and enough space in the sanctuary so that the concelebrants can process around it several times during the liturgy and incense it. There have to be places in the church for processions also, and there have to be stations for icons. Icons are going to be the, the main feature of this church. Now, what makes both of these projects instances of sacred architecture? Is there any commonality in the idea of the sacred, of sacred space? One approach to that, to these commonalities, 
is the idea that things are sacred by their associations. That's an idea that I think that was implicit in a lot of what we've heard so far in these in our talks. Associations that are pre-conscious and sometimes conscious. Probably most of us are familiar with the very famous passage in Marcel Proust's A la recherche du temps perdu, in which he recounts how the taste of a cookie, a madeleine, awakens in him what he calls an all-powerful joy and a sense of well-being that goes far beyond the pleasure of just eating this cookie. He says, I raised to my lips a spoonful of the tea in which I had soaked a morsel of the cake. No sooner had the warm liquid and the crumbs with it touched my palate than a shudder ran through my whole body, and I stopped, intent upon the extraordinary changes that were taking place. An exquisite pleasure had invaded my senses, but individual, detached, with no suggestion of where it came from. And at once, all the vicissitudes of life had become indifferent to me. Its disasters, innocuous. Its brevity, illusory. This new sensation had on me the effect which love has of filling me with a precious essence. Or rather, this essence was not in me, it was myself. I had ceased now to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. Whence could it have come to me, that all-powerful joy? I was conscious that it was connected with the taste of the tea and cake, but that it infinitely transcended those savors, could not indeed be of the same nature as theirs. Whence did it come? What did it mean? How could I seize upon it and define it? Suddenly, a memory returns. The taste was of that little crumb of Madeleine, which on Sunday mornings at Combray, my aunt used to give to me, dipping it first in her own cup of tea. So Proust associates his sudden feeling of pleasure and indeed of kind of ecstasy with a sensory stimulus before it awakens the memory that's associated with it. He's like Pavlov's dogs. He reacts automatically to this learned association. And then he remembers the reason for it at least according to his account. That minds work by associations seems indisputable. Some associations like Proust's are highly personal. There are people that hold that there are also sense experiences that generally or even universally evoke particular emotional reactions. And that claim has been made particularly for music. In Dryden's Ode to St. Cecilia, which was sent to music by Handel, he asked rhetorically, what passion cannot music raise and quell? And he gives examples. And similarly in Nicholas Brady's Hail Bright Cecilia, which was set by Henry Purcell, the poet proclaims music's mighty art to court the ear or strike the heart. At once the passions to express and move. We hear and straight we grieve or hate, rejoice or love. These passages express the so-called doctrine of affects, the affectenlehre, that was widespread in the musical theory of the Baroque era. The notion was that musical sounds and the arrangements of them are able to express emotions. And by doing that, they produce the same emotions in the listeners 
automatically. A similar idea was already present in ancient Greek musical theory and in Chinese musical theory and in Indian musical theory. And it emerged again in European Romanticism. Along the same lines, Pythagoras had long ago anticipated the physicist Paul Dirac's contention that God is a mathematician. The world is mathematical, and so are the human body and the human mind. We respond directly to what is numerically structured. Musical intervals and sounds are harmonious and pleasing if they correspond to simple, rational, numerical relationships. That's the theory. Medieval thought connected this idea with Aristotelian cosmology and concluded that earthly music imperfectly reflects the music of the spheres, the motions of the heavens, the order of the cosmos, which is mirrored on various levels in history, in ideas, and in nature, and in the arts. All of them, including the proportions of the human body, are this basic mathematical pre-conscious uh, response that we have. Medieval theory considered that music was the prime example of this reflection of order. But there were other supposedly natural associations that was thought to be found in the visual arts, including architecture. In Europe, the Pythagorean platonic mathematical approach reached its apogee in the Renaissance. Artists headed by Leon Battista Alberti consolidated and popularized the mathematical interpretation of all matter. And also they thought that mathematical proportions expressed correlations between the visible and the intelligible world. Proper mathematical proportions of bodies were thought to, what, to be what constitutes formal beauty. Buildings according that were constructed according to mathematical ratios were literally music in stone. And you can see this in any number of Renaissance buildings. You look, you look at the facade of Santa Croce in Gerusalemme in Florence, and your eyes see the musical interval, do, sol, as repeated over and over again. You're not conscious of that uh, the way I've just said it, but that's your, your eye kind of hears that music. The theosophical movement of the early 20th century gave the same kind of value to colors and shapes. Artists that were influenced by that movement believe that color exercises direct influence on the human soul, or as we might say, the human mind. And empirical research seems to bear out some of the intuitions of the artists. Colors, different colors do seem to tend to produce in viewers psychological and biological reactions that are similar even across cultures. So musical sounds, shapes, colors, and dimensions seem to produce associations of feelings that are to some extent transcultural and maybe even instinctive. Anjan Chatterjee has demonstrated that some of these components of aesthetics, including even mathematical relations, can be shown to be related to evolutionary adaptiveness and are amenable to empirical investigation by neuroscience. And the same seems to be true also of certain symbols and some aspects of language. 
So it seems quite possible to make some limited generalizations about common characteristics of experiences of certain kinds, while recognizing that there are differences that depend upon physical, cultural, social, and individual circumstances and situations. So what about religion or spirituality? What about the encounter with the divine or with God or with the holy or with ultimate reality? Are there common features of such experiences? Except on a purely idealistic or dualistic philosophical position, it would seem to make sense that there has to be an evolutionary biological basis for all our experiences, including our spiritual experience. But are there specific spatiotemporal conditions that produce, or at least favor, the arising of these experiences? Very famously, the German Lutheran pastor Rudolf Otto proposed that there are his theory of associations. He said, we find and we produce mental states that are analogous to what he considers the special religious experience of the holy. The English title of his work is The Idea of the Holy, but the German title is more revealing. Das Heilige, the Holy, über das Irrationale in der Idee des Göttlichen und sein Verhältnis zum Rationalen. Over about the irrational in the idea of the godly and its relationship to the rational. He reminds us then that the primary field of religion is not theology, but non rational feeling, what we might widely call aesthetics. Otto attempts to explain the relations of that realm of the holy to the aesthetic by what he calls a law of associations. For him, religion is grounded in the experience of the holy or the numinous, as he also calls it, which he defines as the mysterium tremendum et fascinans, the awesome or frightful and attractive mystery, fascinating mystery. You'll recognize elements that Dr. Chatterjee talked about last night. For Otto, this experience is sui generis. It cannot be reduced to moral or aesthetic experience or any other kind of experience. Nevertheless, he says the feelings produced by it have analogies to feelings produced by other areas of human life, by beauty, by moral goodness, by truth. So he says the presence of one set of feelings can stimulate the appearance of an analogous set of feelings. So for him, music or art properly constitute a world unto themselves. The feelings and the moods that they produce are simply aesthetic and they should not be confused with any non-aesthetic experience. At the same time, he says, some properly aesthetic vibrations of mood are analogous to those aroused by the encounter with the holy. And by association, they can evoke the numinous in the hearer's or the viewer's consciousness. So he concludes that some forms of art are intrinsically more suited to serve as the medium and the expression of religious content than others are. But it seems to me that Otto's theory raises some fundamental questions. Granted, there are aesthetic associations and correspondences between physical forms, psychic states, and mental dispositions. Some of them seem to be instinctive. 
But I wonder, is there, as Otto thinks, a specific experience of the holy? To put it differently, should we speak, should we speak at all of an experience of the holy or religious experience? Or is religion rather an interpretation of experiences of all kinds? If we admit that, then what we call religious experience is not the experience of any particular object, God or the noumen or the cosmos, which provokes the experience of the numinous, but rather it is among other things, a way of approaching or categorizing very varied experiences. Otto was aware of that. And he was also aware that the psychological associations relevant to the sacred occur through what Gordon Graham has called transcendent ideas, as well as numinous feelings. Nevertheless, he th thinks that feeling is the basic level and that on that level, there is a commonality centered on what he names the holy the mysterium tremendum et fascinans. But I wonder to what extent is Otto's analysis tied to a particular kind or a particular stage of religion? Otto acknowledges that his idea of the holy as what is uncanny, ungeheim, haunted, derives from primitive religion. It develops into the biblical idea of God as the holy other, that is totally different from the world. But couldn't you center on other features of the holy? The mystery that human transcendence points to is not only awesome, and attractive in Otto's sense. It's also the mystery of unity, the mystery of beauty, the mystery of being, the mystery of identity, the mystery of intelligibility, the mystery of difference, the mystery of love maybe. The primitive noumen corresponds to the world of things. It is a thing. It corresponds to the spaces and the forces of nature and the sometimes dark, irrational terrors that they occasion. On the other hand, the experience of mind and the encounter with persons lead to different conceptions of the divine or the numinous or the holy. Notably, they lead to a notion of God as being transcendent and beyond imagination. So it's not surprising that the world religions and philosophies reveal pantheistic ideas and panentheistic ideas and intersubjective ideas of what is really numinous ideas that emphasize the imminence and the relationality of God. So the numinous, if we look at religions in their development, is not merely tremendum and fascinans, it may also be ultimate peace, nirvana. It may be ultimate self, atman. It may be ultimate emptiness, Shunya, it may be ultimate beauty, tokalon, or love, agape. It seems to me that Otto's position also raises a question about aesthetic experience. Is it, as he holds, simply the emotional analog of another spiritual experience, so that it works exclusively by association of feelings? Or can music, art, and architecture in themselves be a means of transcendent experience? 
And that leads to a re-examination of Otto's basic premise. Is the human experience of the holy a separate experience alongside of those of the beautiful, the good, and so forth? Or could it be identical with those experiences when they're looked at in their deepest reality, in their mystery? In that case, the holy is only one way of naming or pointing to this transcendental ground. So that spiritual experience would be wider than specifically religious experience. And the apprehension of the transcendent would be wider than the feeling of the sacred. Without denying the essential validity of the notion of the association of feelings operating on many different levels, it's perhaps possible nevertheless to regard the mind's apprehension of a transcendent mystery, not simply as a parallel experience, but more as a kind of meta experience, or as Kant would say, as a condition for experience. Theologically speaking, it seems to me, mystery is not simply something unknown or even unknowable, but it's the permanently ungraspable horizon of our acts of knowing, and very importantly, our acts of unknowing, and our recognition of our unknowing. If we take that perspective, then we never experience the divine directly in itself. We deduce it from our acts of experience and judging things or events or people as being holy because they mediate something that is non-objective and that transcends categorical experience, although it's present in particular experiences. That suggestion is based upon the idea that there is an underlying implicit transcendental or transcendent reference or intentionality in the sense that Brentano and the phenomenologists use that word, an intentionality in spiritual experience that becomes thematic only when you think about it, when you reflect on it. Its object, or better, because it really doesn't have an object, its intention is an implicitly prehended goal, which is the mysterium, the ground of being and of thinking, which in some religious contexts may be called God. This mysterious goal is never experienced in itself as a categorical object, because it isn't a categorical object but it is co-intended as the dimension of mystery that's implicit in all human knowing and loving. And importantly, it seems to me, it's co-experienced not only in knowing, but also in my realization that I do not know and that I can anticipate the unknown, at least by wondering about it. The anticipated complete intelligibility as mystery grounds the analogies that we find in human reactions to integrity, beauty, the good, the real, and the holy. Namely, reactions of awe, wonder, desire, questioning, fear, and anxiety. And on the other hand, Feeling, feelings of peace, fulfillment, and transcendence. And at the personal level, at the same time, detachment and engagement, paradoxically. In consequence, I think that we could say that the explicitly religious or the sacred can arrive out, out, out of or focus on any of the dimensions that are implicit in an encounter with the ultimate. So spiritual experience is not to be defined a priori as a particular kind 
of experience. There are different genres of spiritual experiences. On the pre-ontological level, the pre-philosophical level, they're generally associated with forces of nature, with fear of the unknown, with a sense of the uncanny, as Otto emphasizes. On an ontological level of thinking, they can be centered around truth or reality or beauty or goodness or unity or love or any other aspect of transcendence or on the felt absence of them. On the critical level, spiritual activity centers on seeking the real rather than illusion. On the moral level, it centers on love, intending a universal good instead of egotism or tribalism. On the personal level, it centers on integrity, orientation to wholeness, to God, self, community, and world. And on the aesthetic level, it seems to be an orientation to the beautiful rather than what is simply and only pleasant. It seems to me that spirituality could be centered around any of these or on the lack of them by way of contrast or need or perplexity or wonder. So that for me, it seems that the experience of the holy points to something ultimate. Again, to refer to Kant's terminology, the idea of God is the transcendental condition for our categorical experience. And that would cohere with the idea that the sense of the holy is a mixed rational and non-rational anticipation of something infinite or ultimate. And that would explain why spiritual experience, for example, the experience of deep beauty or love or the order of the world, is often also an experience of yearning and a kind of disappointment, a lack rather than a completion. One can have a very deep sense of presence that is at the very same time a consciousness of absence. That our relation to the transcendent seems always to be mediated by finite realities has a very important consequence. These finite mediations can in principle be discerned. They will have certain characteristics, although perhaps very diverse characteristics. Their presence and the mental conditions for their arising can be investigated phenomenologically and empirically. We've seen that in our speakers here. But as Michael Arby points out, what empirical study reaches can be interpreted religiously or non-religiously. What can be discerned by introspection or by empirical study is the presence of psychological states and physical states characteristically associated with mediations of the transcendent. But whether there is a transcendent is another question. Finally, I think that the notion of God as absolutely transcendent has to, by definition, include the affirmation of God as radically imminent to the world. It's a mistake to oppose transcendence and imminence. They're two sides of the same coin. The imminence transcendence of God demythologizes the naive objective notion of sacred space and time. There is no objectively sacred space or time. The sacred becomes a function of constitutive meanings. So in mythic consciousness, the gods and the demons are physically located, they're physically limited, and they reside in places of power and power-filled events, largely in forests and caverns and rocks and mountains. Sacred space, then, is where the power is present and effective. The location might be thought of as the actual dwelling place 
of the divinity or the demon. Or it might be a position defined by an orientation pointing toward a locus of powerful associations, Mecca for the Muslim, the East, where the sun rises for Christians, for early Christians anyway. I once asked my class, in a class in aesthetics, why did the early Christians worship facing the East? No reaction at all, nobody, nobody had the slightest idea. Suddenly from the back of the class, a young man raised his hand, Mahmoud, a Muslim, and he said, they face the east because that's the direction that Jesus will come in, come from at the last judgment. And he wasn't saying that because he had studied Christianity. He was saying that because that was the doctrine of Islam, at least his, his form of, of Sunni Islam. In contrast to this localization of the divine, an ontological consciousness of God sees God as transcendent and therefore both everywhere and nowhere, but also possibly active in us. So sacred space in a post-mythic consciousness, it seems to me, as a symbolic space, it could be, first of all, simply what society considers sacred. Or it could be the place in which I actually have a heightened consciousness of God's omnipresence. And I have that consciousness because of a retention of metaphorical thinking from my childhood. The church is God's house, for example. Or it could be the place in which there is this heightened consciousness because there is an actual or remembered event of encounter with the ultimate or with what I think is an encounter with the ultimate, or an attempt at such an encounter. Those encounters might be produced or provoked by the consecration of a place, whether in a permanent way, like the temple in Jerusalem, or just for a certain period, the prayer rug and the posture for a Muslim facing toward Mecca. All this presumes a distinction between the divine and the sacred. The divine is the religious name for the mystery itself, although it could also have other names in different patterns of experience, the transcendent, the good, the true, the beautiful, and so forth. On that view, the encounter with the transcendent, imminent, divine, is not restricted to a special type of experience, but it could be found in the most ordinary experience which is emphasized, for example, in Zen. But it's also implicit in Christianity, which insists that the primal religious experience is meeting the needs of others. Practical charity, not exalted feeling, is the criterion. A transcendental conception of God, it seems to be, implies an aesthetic notion of sacred space. Space and time are sacred when they're consecrated, when they're dedicated to some kind of heightening or deepening of consciousness, when they serve or are supposed to serve to bring it about, to evoke it, to remember it, and to sustain it. God is omnipresent, but our awareness of God is not. And so we create spaces dedicated to awareness. Obviously, not all art or architecture seeks depth or transcendence. Art can be a means of communication with very different messages. It can be entertainment. It can be distraction. It can serve a purely functional purpose. And there are very different associations with the feelings connected with spirituality. Art can be spiritual to different degrees and in different ways. Ultimately, it seems to me that what makes space-time sacred or suitable to be sacred is its actual use, 
or its suitability for use in heightening consciousness. And that's in part due to natural associations of mental and bodily states, and in part due to learned associations or purposely assigned associations. There's certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence like Proust's of such states of heightened consciousness. And it seems that there's empirical evidence as well, as some of our speakers have shown. In this view, there's a relativity to the idea of sacredness because what heightens consciousness can vary among persons and cultures and eras. Is the sea beautiful or is it terrifying? Is it the place of God or of demons? I remember one time at the beach, a little girl, obviously from her accent from the South was visiting her grandmother and the grandma took up, up to, to the uh, boardwalk overlooking the ocean and the little girl for the first time in her life saw the ocean. And she said, it's a thing of the devil, grandma. It's a thing of the devil. Our depth experiences can be positive or negative. Experience of beauty, love and fullness or experience of death and failure. Suffering can be sacred because it calls out for its reversal and thus a cry towards saving love. You remember in the Brothers Karamazov, Father Zosima bows before the great sinner, uh, Dmitri, and when he's asked about it later, he says, because he will suffer much. The raising of spiritual consciousness might be accomplished, therefore, in a number, number of over, overlapping ways. First of all, and maybe most important, by the elimination of distraction, the creation of silence and repose. That could be attained, as in Buddhism, by disciplined meditation that withdraws from external influences, even when in the midst of them. Or you could have external circumstances that provide a suitable, sesh, a suitable setting. So Walter Pater writes about a Protestant church of St. Vast, the quiet spaciousness of the place is itself a meditation, an act of recollection, and it clears away the confusions of the heart. Or there could be a direct intention of God or the mystery prayer or dialogue or wonder or a sense of presence. Or there can be representation of God or the holy by image or by art or by the absence of them, as in Quaker churches. Or by functionality, by conveying sacred words and sacred acts, including communion with others. Or by beauty or by sublimity or by symbolism, or by contrast. And of course, any of those ways is real, rarely found alone. They're normally combined. The aesthetic mediation materials and styles that one selects will largely depend on the situation you're addressing. Should you concentrate on finding God in the ordinary and the everyday, or could you strive to create a sense of separateness and mystery? Quaker meeting halls or Gothic cathedrals? Yogic meditation or dancing the aisles with or without snakes? Or something that tries to incorporate, incorporate both? Should religious spaces be built on associations rooted in our psyche? very much the Thomistic principle that grace presupposes nature, or should it avoid them on the principle that the supernatural crushes and destroys sinful nature? In our days, it seems to me there's an additional challenge of serving diverse and pluralistic communities. 
Can you find a spiritual aesthetics, including architecture, that will address the many different sorts and levels of spirit? Can we identify particular social schemas of an aesthetics of sacred space while acknowledging the plurality of situations and leaving room for diversity of taste and ambiguity? A Christian's holiness is achieved in the love of neighbor, which is inseparable from the love of God. So the letter of James says, religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unpolluted by the world. Not, notice that he doesn't mention exalted feeling. Sacred religious space has to be in some way a locus of love for the Christian. But it's important to remember, I think, that sacred architecture need not be only a delimitation of sacred space. It can have other functions, aesthetic, practical, social, and so forth. And finally, I return to the ambiguity inherent in the attempt to create sacred space and time. In spirituality, there's a danger of mistaking the feelings associated with heightened presence for the presence itself. One can have exalted feelings produced by a church building, the smell of wax and incense, the peace and awesomeness of the surroundings, the memories of a perhaps lost childhood faith. And yet, with all of that, one can be quite unconverted. From a phenomenological point of view, using that word phenomenological in a very wide sense, Authenticity is not necessary to identify ultimacy experiences. One can be in love with the aesthetics of religion without being in love with God or one's neighbor. In a novel of the Russian writer Sologub, one character asks another, well, if you're a pagan, then why do you go to church? Lyudmila stopped laughing and grew pensive. Well, she said, one has to pray. You have to pray, weep, light candles, commemorate the dead. And I love all of it, the candles, the icon lamps, the incense, the vestments, the singing, if the singers are good, the icons, their mountings, the ribbons, yes, it's all so beautiful. Physical spaces, it seems to me, can provide contexts that permit and evoke religious, intellectual, and moral conversion, and at their best, can support their integration. Well, just how they do it or can do it is, I think, what we're here to discuss. Thank you, Richard. I think we're going to do the same thing we did yesterday night. Uh, we're going to invite three uh, individuals to respond to uh, Richard's uh, lecture. Um, the first one will be Anjan Chatterjee. He, he's the founding director of the Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics. He wrote the aesthetic brain and co-edited Brain Beauty and Art and uh, Neuroaesthetics in Practice and the Root of Cognitive Neuroscience. He uh, has served on editorial boards of several neuroscience, neurology, ethics, and aesthetic journals. He received the Ishwind Prize in Cognitive Neurology by the American Academy of Neurology and the Arnheim Prize for Contribution to Psychology and the Arts by the American Psychological Association. He was um, past president of the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics and the Behavioral Cognitive Neurology Society. Anchet, please.
I really didn't expect you to repeat all that again. <laughs> um, there's so much there. To move this so you can see me. Um, so in the early 90s, uh, I started my faculty position at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And uh, around that time, uh, there was a professor in the English department who wrote a book called Salvation on Sand Mountain, uh, which was a, an account of snake handlers uh, about half an hour from where we were. Uh, and this was a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, and I would drive around uh, Sand Mountain, uh, but I never got to actually uh, see or participate in a <laughs> snake handling um, uh, form of worship. Um, what you had to say was very, very rich and also quite removed from what I typically do. Uh, so anything I say is a real stretch. Having said that, I think a question I would like to ask and then work my way towards it is mystery was a dominant theme in much of what you talked about. And the question is, are there different forms of mystery? Uh, and it in some ways might seem like a paradoxical question because the nature of mystery is to not know, but is there ways in which we can ask, uh, are there different forms of not knowing and, uh, and what might that mean? You did talk about how forms of art or forms of architecture can serve as vehicles towards the transcendence. And that's a kind of thing that, a kind of idea that has some purchase for people who do empirical work, because then the questions are under what conditions does that happen? Are there features about art? Are there features about architecture? Are there features about the people inhabiting those places that predispose them? Those are all, at least in principle, tractable questions, and one can start to address. And that just gets you closer and closer without necessarily getting you at the core of what I think you're driving at. The other uh, point around this is uh, the law of associations. Uh, and some of what I presented towards the end of my talk yesterday uh, with these kinds of semantic networks that we're working on is a kind of laying out a law of associations, uh, which, as I mentioned yesterday, even with the notion of sacred, can that be deconstructed as different uh, associated ideas to sacred? Uh, does that, um, is that associated with notions of awe and wonder? Is it associated with notions of contemplation? Is it associated with notions of sympathy and love and empathy? Is it associated with notions of humility? All those show up in our networks. Uh, and so it starts to give some, I think, some granularity to the notion of even what, what's, what travels along with notions of awe and wonder and how would you try to characterize uh, what it is uh, to be sacred uh, and that that might take different forms as well. But it still gets us to this question of mystery. And uh, there's another term that is used, uh, especially when people are talking about art, and it came up this morning in some of the panel discussions, which is the ineffable. And the ineffable seems to me has some relationship perhaps to how you're talking about uh, mystery, but the ineffable presupposes some knowledge of what is effable. And so our question is what is effable? And so in that sense, I think this kind of taxonomic uh, project that we're involved in is to say, can you introduce, can you identify, can you teach people categories and a vocabulary to try to become aware of and bring to consciousness, explicit consciousness, the granularity of rich, rich experiences. And to me that, and, and this is something at uh, in other conferences 
I have, people have challenged me on the idea that maybe if you give too much language, you destroy the experience. Uh, I think that is not true. I think that might, there's a transition period where that might be true. But in the same way that if you uh, are taught a vocabulary of how to experience wine or experience a sip of bourbon, that this actually in time enriches your experience. And so our, you know, this is uh, certainly a matter for discussion, but our belief is having a very rich, rich vocabulary, which is identifying what is effable and teaching people what is effable gets you to the edge of what is ineffable. And I think it, it, it I would venture to say uh, doing that gets you to maybe a more precious uh, and a more treasured kind of mystery. But the broader question using this kind of uh, work that we're doing and thinking is, are there different kinds of mysteries? I would say, first of all, that, that I guess I agree that there, there are different kinds of mystery. The word mystery itself is, is analogous and, uh, and used in different ways. Um, and I agree also that there are means of bringing people to recognize limit experiences. I mean, we're going to have limit experiences if, if we're human. At some point or other, we're going to have such experiences. We're all going to be challenged with failure and sickness and death and lack of understanding and so forth. Um, the question is, what do we do with them? Do we recognize them? Uh, is there an opportunity in them to, to transcend, to get beyond? Um, and I think that, as you said, there, there are means of bringing people to the point where, where, it, it, where it's possible, uh, where, the, where they're faced with an, a decision, an existential uh, decision about it. And of course, one can fail in that too. Uh, of course, in, in, in both in Hinduism and in Buddhism, there are uh, darshanas, there, there are schools of just how you do that. Uh, particularly in Buddhism with the teaching of, of meditation, but also in, in uh, uh, the yoga darshanas in Hinduism. And it's uh, largely lost in the West, but the West also has um, spiritual schools of trying to bring people to that kind of experience and decision. Some of them very explicitly cataphatic, that is using words, using images. You think of say the Ignatian method of meditation. Some of them explicitly renouncing all of that. You think of John of the Cross uh, uh, and his schools of, of meditation. So I think again, we're faced with the, you know, the anek, antavada, the no, no single point of view. But in that pluralism, I think that we can find certain things that we can identify as limit experiences and pointing beyond them. I'm going to do a reduced uh, version of the introduction since we know each other, uh, just in case for the record in the future. Um, Gordon Graham will be the second uh, responder. He's the chair of the Edinburgh Sacred Arts Foundation, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and the Arts at Princeton, Theological Seminary in the USA, so over here, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Scotland's premier academy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for your uh, talk. And as, uh, as in remarked, it's very uh, rich and extensive. So I just want to throw into the mix um, a different way of thinking. Uh, I think that our attitude to aesthetics has been shaped very much uh, by Immanuel Kant. And famously, uh, in Kant's third critique, he characterizes uh, art and the aesthetic in terms of purposefulness, but without purpose. So it is removed uh, from the world of action and into the world of experience. But someone who reacted uh, very forcefully to this was Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche wanted to uh, underline the fact, as he said, there are two artistic spirits, 
uh, and he labeled them the Apollonian and the Dionysian. The Apollonian is indeed, uh, broadly speaking, the contemplation of sensual experience. It might be auditory as well as visual, though our emphasis tends to be on the visual. But the Dionysian is um, activity. And he thought of the activity, um, the most straightforward example, being a kind of possession in dance. Now, this dis division between the Apollonian and the um, Dionysian seems to be immensely important. And when you start to apply it uh, across uh, different aspects of thinking about the arts, uh, then it generates more and more uh, distinctions of significance. And I just want to mention two or three of these, and I want to begin uh, with where you started. So your question was, <clears throat> what is there in common between a <clears throat> Gothic cathedral and the, or um, Byzantine church and the snake handler's space. But there is in fact uh, an important distinction between uh, sacred space and meeting place. And I think uh, that uh, there was a, a movement, a detectable charitable movement within Protestant Christianity that completely rejected the idea of sacred spaces in preference to meeting places. And there was a theological basis for this because they thought and still think uh, that the church is not a place, but a community. Uh, it is the body of Christ. And so the reason uh, that Quaker meeting houses are extremely plain is not that they had a different aesthetic or that they were moved to aesthetic experience a different way, but they thought that all of that was irrelevant to the thing that really mattered, which was simply the gathering of the body of Christ. And that could be anywhere. So the meeting place was just a convenient location, keep the weather out and the heat in. A second uh, important distinction, I think, actually uh, along these same lines is between the religious and the spiritual. And this is one that sociologists have uh, investigated and, and made something of. It's a, a notable sociological fact that as um, participation in organized religion has declined, <clears throat> So the rise of popular spirituality, or I say those who claim to be spiritually motivated and interested, rises. So uh, spiritual as individual experience, and some people think this is because we live in such a deeply individualistic culture. So what comes to matter then is uh, my experience. And then you ask, is my experience an avenue to God or not, or just these, and so on. Otto, it seems to me, buys into the Kantian picture. Uh, but if you think of the Nietzschean picture, I should, of course, say Nietzsche was an avid uh, atheist and um, so celebrated for the expression, God is dead. Uh, and he thought actually that our art and the artistic would flow into the space that the death of religion created. But leave that aside, we uh, think in Nietzschean terms of division, there is this important separation between religion and spirituality. And uh, one of the things about uh, this way of thinking is it generates a different conception of the sacred. The sacred and this way of thinking is not as were something that has a kind of resonance or uh, echo or um, analogy uh, with the mysterious and the transcendental and the holy other. The sacred is that which is set aside for certain sorts of purposes. And although from this point of view, uh, the relevant emotion is connected with awe and wonder, the actual heart of the matter is uh, the attitude and action of veneration. So if you think of, for example, the preservation of relics, then a bit of bone or something, there's nothing beautiful about that. It's not that uh, it's going to uh, give you tingles or anything of that kind. It is rather that uh, the history of this bone is, let's just say, this actually is, or take, take a better example, uh, this is a, a portion 
of the true cross. So to, I once read that if you got all together all the fragments of the true cross, you'd have the cedars of Lebanon. So it's not a trace that they are, but it doesn't matter for my purposes. So the reason that you uh, have a certain attitude to this little piece of wood is not that it's beautiful or that it gives you a buzz or anything, but it came from the cross on which Christ was crucified. And that notion of veneration and reservation, if you think of, um, say, sacred vessels, as these are used for uh, mass or commun uh, communion, then those sacred vessels, they're often indeed very high um, uh, artistic, but what makes them sac sacred is not their beauty, but their uh, reservation for one purpose only. And that is why the Jews got so upset in ancient Israel when Roman emperors and the like took all their stuff to use them as feasting goblets and so on. So I just want to, as I say, throw into this discussion <clears throat> the idea that um, simply focusing on experience and thinking about religious experience in the fashion of Otto and indeed in the fashion of um, those kinds of experiments that try to uh, distill and, and examine uh, experiential responses on the part of human beings leaves out of account what is actually very deeply at the heart of religion, and that is the practices of veneration and adoration uh, and those practices, of course, bring with them certain emotions. But it's important to see if we're following Nietzsche's way of thinking that it's the practice that is the heart, not uh, the uh, feelings or experiences that go with them. And so when we think of uh, sacred things, uh, then this is um, objects, Places actually, some occasionally people who are set aside, preserved, protected, removed, reserved for certain specific purposes, and those purposes uh, are are built into and connected with a wider range of human activity, which we call ritual. And not all rituals are um, religious rituals, but the same thing uh, is important. With, with this, I'm. Going to finish. If you take a ritual, a pure ritual, uh, like the inauguration of the American president, now it is not the inauguration that gives the president the authority that he or she has. Uh, it's not the inauguration that decides who is going to be president. And it's certainly not the case that the feelings that are uh, generated, if they are, and of course they'll depends who's being inaugurated, but the feelings might go many different ways. Uh, it's not the feelings that bestow upon the person the authority that they have. It is actually the ritual itself that bestows the authority. And the way I like to put this in terms of political philosophy is to say, it turns power into authority. So political power becomes the exercise of authority. How? through ritual. So anyway, I just threw this in, uh, uh, that there is a, a very important dimension to my mind about understanding the sacred that has to do with activity and not with experience. And ultimately, of course, these things have to be woven together. But I do think there is a, a tendency to focus too heavily on the notion of experience and specific kinds of experience or a variety of experience um, as the central concept when we consider the sacred. And I'm just not sure that's so. Yes, thank you, Gordon, for uh, pointing out that uh, there are dimensions of sacredness uh, that don't have anything directly to do with sacred space time. Uh, you know, our focus here is on built environment and architecture. So I, th I think that has understandably been, been our emphasis. Um, but obviously, as I said, and as others have indicated, that the central uh, part of uh, Christianity and of other religions is action um, rather than just things or 
spaces. Uh, so I, I, I thought that's a very uh, salutary reminder, I think. Thank you. Uh, our last uh, respondent is uh, Sarah Robinson. She's an architect, writer, and educator. Her books, Nesting, Body, Dwelling Mind from 2011, Mind in Architecture from 2015 with Yuhani Palasma, and Architecture is Verb 2021, are among the first works to engage the dialogue between architecture and the cognitive sciences. So it's interesting that you defined aesthetic according to Kant, which is a good starting point, that it's a purpose without a purpose. But the root of the word aesthetic comes from aesthetikos, which is Greek for sense perception. So there's a really broad meaning to aesthetic, the word aesthetic itself, but we use it in the special way. And um, I want to touch upon your the part that you talked about not the non-rational kind of harvesting non-rational experiences in the in the religious experience and point to two thinkers. One is Ellen Disan Disaniaki, who's an art historian and an anthropologist. And her theory of art is that art came from the intimate relationship our earliest intimate relationship between the mother and the child. So if you think about human beings, unlike other animals, we come in totally helpless into the world. We can't do anything. And um, Ashley Montague calls that the fourth trimester, that we're born basically uncooked and we become human in the arms of another or we don't become human at all. So these early rhythms, of the mother-child relationship, according to Ellen, um, are the basis of music, the prosody at the basis of music. And I want to paraphrase Plato here, who's, you know, often, um, you know, we think of Plato's world of forms, but he, he also said that rhythm has a very powerful effect on the mind, a very um, mysterious effect on the mind, which ties, I think, directly into what Ellen Desaniaki is writing about. And there's another thinker, a neuroscientist called Walter Freeman, who wrote a really interesting paper about music being a technology of bonding, that the basic rhythms of music touch on our deepest emotions, which the Greeks well knew. Um, and to add to that, John Dewey insisted that the ear is our is the emotional sense so the sense of sound is is something so profoundly moving to us that unborn babies start to hear inside the womb shortly after being born they can they can pick out their mother's voice from a host of other voices so affect and sound are so deeply interrelated and so this, I mean, I'm not Catholic, but I used to go to Catholic churches in Switzerland when, when I lived there just to be part of the sound and the smell and the coming together of people. So if we look at also the word religion, it's re-legare, legare to tie together. So this, this technology of bonding that music is had had a great effect in tying people together. So um, when you were speaking, I was wondering to myself, is the holy an intensification of our interconnectedness, of our interdependence? Is the holy an intensification of this deep interdependence we have with each other that we're not ever alone and and is religions i mean so i in my own experience i don't see it as so separate and if we take all the other you know all the other trappings away it comes down to this deep sense of interdependence so i just wonder what you thought of that
Yes, thank you. I, I, I agree that the, our sense of interdependence uh, is crucial, particularly uh, when religion develops as, as, it, as it becomes uh, more civilized and, and less object related. And uh, as, as I think I said, more, more interpersonal, uh, it becomes deeper. And that is, of course, I think the primary locus of the sacred is in the interpersonal. Uh, although there are other ways of thinking of that too. You know, maybe for example, Buddhism renounces the whole concept of person and therefore also of interpersonality. And yet it, it still actually remains as a, as a religion of compassion, only named very differently. Uh, I think that, that um, uh, this reminds us that uh, um, as Gordon also reminded us, we, we could have another international symposium about the sacred in music, as well as the sacred in architecture, the sacred in space, the sacred in, in aesthetics. Uh, we, we've, many of us have a, a propensity to, to value the visual, and I know that I do, um, although I, you know, I play a couple of instruments, but principally my, my engagement with art is visual art uh, and uh, painting and drawing. Uh, and I think that many of us have that uh, visual bias or visual preference, let's say, in our society. And yet I think the other, the, the musical, and as you say, the, 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 the deep roots of music in interpersonal relation, for, for example, between mother and child, you know, the, the, I, one of my nieces recently had children, so I'm reminded of this, you know, all of the, all of the uh, personality traits of her children that she knew when they were in the womb, uh, they, they were already acting the way they now act as one-year-olds. Um, so so they, there's a whole enormous area there, I think, for explanation, exploration. And uh, thank you for reminding us of it. Thank you. I think, uh, I think it's time now to open up the uh, Q&A for the public, the uh, attendees. Um, so to, to ask questions or, or comments, um, please uh, press your hand. I will take the microphone to you. I wonder what Jonathan had to say about music and you want to say something? Let's come up with something. He just had a symposium on music and second in Stanford, so I was there. So first of all, thank you for um, these really eloquent and um, beautiful words. Um, I think um, I almost don't know where to start. The um, the description of the perfection of music is one that um, is historically there, but a little bit warped over time. Um, the the notion of consonance um, as as a measure of perfection in perfect intervals. Uh, first of all, we have to remember that um, that uh, this was um, in a in a in an untempered world. So those intervals were not as we hear them at all at all now. And secondly, um, the uh, the notion of consonance um, is is one that's. I mean, there are two types of consonance and dissonance. There's, there's musical consonance, which is purely from a cultural perspective. Not all cultures share this sense of consonance. And then there's, there's sensory consonance and dissonance. And that is indeed universal, but that, that's far from the musical um, organizational uh, perspective that you gave in your talk. Um, similarly, the doc doctrine of affections, which, of which I'm, I'm, um, I've always been very interested in, um, it's it's true that um, that it purported to be a, a sort of a universal um, dictionary of of feelings and expressions, but the assumption was that they were attained experientially. Right? I don't think there was ever an assumption that it's intrinsically a part of nature that that F minor is is a religious key or that b minor is the key of the of the of the of the death of jesus or that a major because of its three sharps 
um, symbolizes the, the crucifixion. These were all things that sort of uh, amassed over time. Um, so I, I think it's it's a little bit um, it's a little bit troubling to me to hear to 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 think of this as sort of this this perfect organization. Um, that's uh, there's a lot more to it than that. But I do I do think your 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 um, your descriptions of 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 um, of the musical role in ritual is really very beautiful. Thank you. I think I, um, I should point out uh, okay. I should point out uh, I think the the uh, effect in Lehrer as it actually existed went way too far. They they made far too many claims. Uh, for for what was supposed to be communicated uh, by music, so I I, I agree uh, I agree totally with that. I think that there is, as you said, there is there are some natural uh, consonances, and and uh, maybe Anjan and others can uh, can address that more. But a, a great deal more, I think, is is cultural, and I think that also. I don't know whether the musicians were conscious of this, but certainly the visual artists were conscious of it. You know, for, for example, Alberti explicitly says, when he talks about ratios, uh, he says, the important thing is not to have the ratio physically, it's to look like you have the ratio. <laughs> Uh, so they, they were, at least the artists were to a certain extent aware of the subjectivity and the um, variability of the, of their theories. So um, I will be a temporary representative of the previous administration, that is the Jewish profession, the Jewish sense of sacredness. Um, there's a different relationship in the design of synagogues, in some cases, in many cases, between what is sacred and what becomes Im embodied in the physical place. Because one of the theories of, not one of the theories, one of the, one aspect of Jewish theology is that the sacred is everywhere and in your behavior and your relationships. And so for the Orthodox, there are a million blessings for everything from putting on your shoes to getting up in the morning to going to bed at, at night. The home is a sacred place because so many of those things take place in the home. The synagogue is not a place where the sacred begins. The sacred is intensified by it being a communal moment, not because it's different in kind, it's different in relationship. So my firm designed a synagogue at one point that had two large wings, two walls that started very wide and converged toward the actual physical entrance, the threshold into the space. But that narrowing continued toward the sanctuary. And the notion was being expressed that the world is sacred and it doesn't stop being sacred. It just becomes a more intensified experience of sacredness when you get in. So that, that actually drove the architecture. Second thing I'll just mention is Proust was a neuroscientist is a book. <laughs> you mentioned Proust. And I just noted, I looked up the table of contents and Proust is listed as a neuroscientist, among others who preceded neuroscience insights, listed as Igor Stravinsky, Paul Cezanne, Walt Whitman, Gertrude Stein, and Proust. Robin. Thank you for that. I, I wanted to compliment both of you, Gordon and Richard. Um, and something that bothers me a lot, which is the use of the word beauty um, all the time. And I've confessed this to my even my students that I, I I'm always troubled when theolo you know theologians use the word beauty and they kind of throw it away like we all know what that is. And it was so interesting that you pointed out that beauty doesn't really necessarily required for something to be sacred at all. It can be a relic, a piece of the cross. It can be a bit of bone. It can be an action that's taking place in the space. And so when we think about these transcendentals and we kind of get, at least theologians get kind of hooked on them, we don't really stop to think, what, what are we talking about? And, and why is that something that we just seem to be 
using in a in a way that we I, we think everybody understands what we mean, and I'm not sure we do. Yes, I think I think that's true. I mean, it's, the uh, the notion of beauty is one that we you know it's it's become common to to talk about it, and and maybe we shouldn't talk about it so facilely. Because uh, because there are all kinds of presuppositions. I mean, I realize that when I use the word beauty, uh, I'm thinking I'm thinking in Latin. Yeah. I'm thinking pulcritudo, uh, and uh, and all of us probably bring a certain amount of baggage to it. So, but uh, but I think it's it's very unclear just what the beautiful is, and that's that's another discussion. I think that that uh, that is very worth having. What what do we even mean when we use the word beautiful. Um, and of course, as, as you know, there, historically, there are great debates about that, about what, what is beautiful, is, is beautiful simply uh, what pleases the eye, as St. Thomas says at one place, uh, or is the beauty is beautiful, the beautiful or transcendental, uh, is the, the beautiful identical with being, um, which is another point of view. And uh, the other, another point that you make that I think is very crucial is that the sacred need not have anything to do with beauty. It can be, as as I said, it can be the the lack of it, and uh, sometimes the, the the most sacred objects, particularly in in, in uh, early religion, the most sacred uh, objects are not beautiful ones. Uh, they are sometimes spectacularly ugly, uh, uh, but uh, but precisely for that reason, they are different and holy, and they, they embody a, a, a presence that's not present in, in a beautiful object. I'm just thinking of the icon of Mary in Rome, because the painting is very ugly, yeah. <laughs> very holy. <laughs> I'm going to just add something to this little conversation, but also to something that I think he has result of what Norton said. Um, I know it's a disease of philosophers, they always draw distinctions, but anyway, here's a few distinctions. Um, it seems to me that Mount Sinai was a holy place. And when Moses come down from Mount Sinai, his face is so bright that the ordinary folks can't take it. He has to cover his face with a veil. But the temple at Jerusalem was not in that sense a holy place. It was a sacred space. And one way you might characterize that is by saying Mount Sinai is a place to encounter God. Uh, the temple in Jerusalem is a place to serve God. And that has important dimensions because it means ordinary folks who aren't uh, are much removed from mystical experiences, who aren't anything like Moses, can still uh, relate to God. But then that uh, made me think, well, uh, of course, the dramatic um, change with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is that Judaism ceased to be a temple religion. Uh, and so uh, in the second temple, I once read, there were 10,000 priests scattered across, uh, and now there aren't any. And in that sense, the synagogue, uh, here's just a question, I suppose, what is the difference between the synagogue and the temple? There's some deep conceptual difference. But of course, a synagogue could just be as architecturally self-conscious or uh, as, as beautifully decorated as a temple might be. So there's a change there from temple to synagogue, but it's not going to be captured uh, in the aesthetics of the space. Just one second. I, I want to take my my moderator power here. Say a couple things. Um, you know, as I, as I listen to the presentation of Richard and then follow up by Gordon, uh, the the thickness of the experiences and interpretation of sacred spaces, kind of following what Yoshi was talking about, thin experiences and thick experiences. Uh, you know, and then I put my hat as a researcher and empirical Anjan's point that okay, well we're dealing with the built environment and we want to try to measure something, right? Uh, and whatever you measure will never fit the thickness of description that you guys are talking about. So uh, I think going back to the conversation this morning, uh, the, the, what is the bridge? What is the bridge where we could have, we could advance the state of the art because clearly if we talk at this level of thickness, we, co we continue that culture. 
And if we, if we keep talking at the level of the quantitative, we keep at the other culture, this conversation we have this morning and the conversation I hope needs to go in between, to go towards the communication. And in that sense, I appreciate what you had to say, uh, Sarah, about you know, perhaps the body, perhaps perception, perhaps the kind of thing that Anjan said, you know, what, what can be really empirically articulated, acknowledging that whatever we're gonna measure is ultimately immeasurable. <laughs> Is <laughs> you know you cannot measure the unmeasurable, and yet you could point at it. You know you could point at the moon. It's not the moon, and I think that's perhaps what our our time, our civilization, this time is something we could offer to the history. Some new new ways in which we could, or not new ways, or other ways in which we begin to think about these 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 issues in ways that are that are different than before, and maybe give us a little more insight. Sorry for taking that. You could disagree with that, by the way. So one more question, and then we need to get a break. Um, just developing on what everyone has said, um, I think of the word transcendence, and we come, keep coming back to that, at least for me. So I um, think at what point transcendence occurs. And I think it's um, looking at the differences because it's, we can't knowingly know everything, but we can see differences. All right, um, I think it's time for coffee. What, how would you have a response? So I I didn't I wasn't able to hear the last uh, question. I think that's right, Sarah. Okay. All right. Time for coffee. So uh, thirty minutes. Come back, please. Thank you. Thank you, Levine. Yeah.